Hello, I'm Sue Stockdale, and welcome to Series 19 of the Access to Inspiration podcast. I'm delighted to have Evelyn von den Heuvel as our guest for Episode 135 today. Now, you might recall that Evelyn interviewed me in Episode 71, where we discussed exploring potential, and now it's my turn to hear from her. Well, in a world increasingly governed by logic, automation and data, the power of intuition often gets sidelined. Evelyn talks to me about the value of embracing intuition in our personal and professional lives and why it matters even more in today's world driven by technology and AI. One of the highlights of our conversation for me was to discover how Evelyn perceives intuition. In her view, it's not separate from creativity, but forms the basis for it. I'm sure you'll find what she has to say enlightening and thought-provoking. And remember, you can read along with the transcription of this episode as you listen on our website, accesstoinspiration.org. Welcome to the podcast, Evelyn. It's lovely to speak to you today. Thank you, Sue. It's lovely to be here with you. It's funny because we're almost having the tables turned here. The last time you and I spoke on this podcast, you were interviewing me. So now you get to have a turn in the hot seat. How does that feel? Yeah, I was thinking about that this morning. I thought, oh, wow, I remember that session so well. And I was so excited to interview you. And I realized oh, I'm actually much more nervous talking about myself than I am. But I also, from all of our interactions, Sue, that we've had in the past, how beautiful and curious your questions are. So I was also intrigued. I was also curious about what will this conversation lead to? <laughs> Well, there you go. You're already kicking it off with that word curiosity. And maybe for the listener to get a sense of context, what I always think about Evelyn is creativity, imagination, intuition, playfulness. So there's a few words to get us started. And it made me think about the word playfulness. And I imagined little Evelyn when she was young playing games. And I wondered what was your favorite game when you were young? Oh, that's such an interesting question. So I was actually quite an introverted child, I think, secretly. Although I did have a strong sense of, I guess, social responsibility. It sounds like a really big word and that that wouldn't be something I would relate to as a child. But I remember having a very strong sense of, oh, yeah, okay, there are other kids. There are other people here. They probably also need attention. But preferably, I was always on my own playing to be an imaginary wild horse. So I was obsessed with horses when I was growing up. And so even long drives in the car, I remember I was always looking out the window and imagining myself as a galloping stallion over the landscape. And I would spend hours building all kinds of hurdles in the backyard to jump over. And I would have whole elaborate storylines about what it was like to be a wild horse. So now you're making me think about freedom and movement. And I know you're a bit of a traveler yourself. Tell us a bit about your backstory, about where you have lived and traveled to. I remember when I turned 30 and I counted how many homes I had lived in by that age. And I came to 36 houses by the age of 30. So that gives a little bit of a sense of how much movement there's been in my life. So I was originally born in Venezuela, in South America. And we lived there for only three years before moving to Bogota, Colombia. And then after about 10 years there, it was the Netherlands, then the Caribbean for a while, then back to Venezuela. So I ended up finishing high school in South America always attending American international schools. But I think that set the tone for this sort of nomadic lifestyle. So I have this experience of the three-year itch, you know, and I've been in one place for three years, then I start to get a little bit edgy and like, oh, I need to move into something new. So I think I carried that throughout my adult life, going from the Netherlands to Brazil, to Australia, to Portugal, back to the Netherlands. So that's sort of been a motion that I carry throughout my life. And what have all of those travels brought to you? What have they taught you? A lot, I think. Probably one of the primary things that traveling has brought me is this thing around question everything. There is something in our systems that likes certainty. Our brains are wired to create safety and certainty in a way. And we like when we have our habitual comfort zones, whether that's a place to live or a rhythm during the day. And I think also, to some extent, we need those to be healthy and okay and take care of ourselves. But I think traveling always reminded me that those are just stories and people do life differently. So if the system that I'm living in doesn't seem to suit my personality or my creativity, for example, then maybe there's a different way to do it. I like that genuine openness, live in the questions more so than live in the answers. 
So I think that was a really, really important element that the travel brought. And another thing, I think it is about connecting with other humans. So the ability to, across cultures, across language barriers, across divides that we might otherwise see in the world, whether that be social economic background or differences in profession or differences in beliefs, to find what it is that you can connect to with one another and always see the other person as the actual human. So I have this story about when I was working in academia straight after graduating from my master's. And I remember being the only one in the hall who took time out to speak to the cleaners who would come in every day. It was always the same cleaners. Just couldn't understand why nobody was curious and wanted to know who these ladies were. <laughs> right? So I think that was an important thing that the traveling brought me. So I'm taking from what you're saying there about seeing the human within and the possibilities as well that travel openness difference can bring. You mentioned there also you had done some academic study. I know you've done a master's in cognitive neuroscience and health psychology. Now that got me curious as to what did you learn from that and how has that influenced your work since then? Beautiful. So I'm going to take it a notch back before that, if that's all right. I think growing up, I was always intrigued by these stories that I would hear about humans breaking their own barriers. So I remember being in a theory of life class in high school and Linda Mishkin, our teacher, this was back in the early 90s, but she would have us doing like visualization exercises on the floor of the classroom, which was quite radical at the time. And she would show us videos about people who made like remarkable hospital recoveries and walked out of a hospital where the doctors had said, no, you will live as a paraplegic for the rest of your life. And so I think it got me intrigued as what's going on here? What's really happening? And I remember being in my first neuroscience class and I had an excellent professor and he was showing us a video about a girl who had such severe epilepsy from the day that she was born that by the age of two, the neurosurgeons had said to her parents, well, we either try to give her a full lobotomy, so take out the half of her brain, or she's going to die from this epilepsy. And so the parents decided to go for that procedure, not knowing at all what was going to be possible for their child. Was she even going to survive? Was she ever going to learn to walk, to talk, right? All of those things. And she learned to do everything in the end. She learned how to walk. She learned how to talk. She had to wear a special helmet to protect her brain and the sensitivity around her head, but she actually learned to do everything. And I thought, wow, there's something here that I want to understand. And I think that always propelled me further into study and then also further into every sort of other exploration that I've done since then. So that's what I really took out of both, because it was two master's degrees. I did cognitive neuroscience and then health psychology basically because I wanted to be more in the human interaction. So I, I wanted to understand what's happening at the face front of this like human experience. And that's what I learned is that we never really know. And I think as mental health practitioners, and I'm, I'm going to make a strong statement here, we have quite a strong responsibility that we, I don't think is always taken into consideration. So I think sometimes we can define limitations for others by what we say to them what we say is possible for them. And we know this already from people who are born blind in a family with fully seeing siblings and they're raised as just one of the siblings and they actually learn how to cope with extra braille or extra ways they develop their own coping strategies. And I think the same is true for mental health in a very important way. I think sometimes when we diagnose, we also create a parameter or a limiting thing around, this is what's possible for you. Or, this is your diagnosis. You're going to be living with this for the rest of your life. And that then becomes somebody's reality. And so I think I'm quite curious about, one, how do we acknowledge that that's what we do? And two, how do we invite people to constantly stretch outside of those parameters? You're taking our conversation a whole wide range of directions now, Evelyn. <laughs> <laughs> so did doing those academic studies answer the questions that you were seeking to find answers to? No, they, they didn't. So <laughs> they started me off in a really wonderful trajectory. I think it was already during my first internship in the psychiatric field for neuroscience that I started to walk into the limitations of what I thought modern science was going to bring me. But I think it was absolutely afterwards when I was working in academia. So I started in the trajectory to do a PhD and I only completed the first year of it. One of the reasons that I decided to step out of academia was because I thought it was too 
confined, too stringent. And simultaneously, I also started to explore other fields like meditation and yoga, mindfulness, and really went to, okay, what do the sort of more ancient philosophies have to say about who we are as humans and what's possible for us. And I think that has turned into what for me is like a continual exploration. I always like to say I'm very anti-dogmatic. I think it works for people to choose maybe, oh, I'm really into transcendental meditation. That's going to be my thing. I'm really into Hatha yoga. That's going to be my thing. I'm really into science. That's going to be my thing. For me, that's never really been the way it works. I'm like a kid at a candy shop and I want to try bits of all the different philosophies and find where they meet, but also where they're different and how that difference can add something to my understanding of what's possible for us as humans, who we are. So I think that's always been the thing that lures me onwards and into different areas and fields. I'm picking up from what you're saying here, a desire to explore the unseen, the unknown, the possibilities or the unconscious, subconscious around us. And I know that you are particularly interested also in the sense of intuition. When thinking about intuition in particular, Evelyn, how do you use your intuition? Going back to the little girl who played in her imaginary world. So I think from an early age, I had a strong intuition although I don't think that I had that word for it back then. And I tried to find ways in which that might be supported by the outside world, by my environment, something that could be maybe nourished. So I remember I went to a Catholic primary school. And in that time, it was a lot about, for me at least, it was prayer and it was about the religion and the practices because it gave me some sense of, oh, here's this connection to something that is untangible or not. But I was raised in a family that was quite pragmatic I think I remember having experiences where I had these senses like, I, I know what somebody's feeling. I've been here before. And every time I would raise that with my parents, it would be something like, well, it's deja vu. And that's actually just a slow processing of the brain of your environment. So there would be this very pragmatic, practical solution or answer. So I think in some ways I put my intuition to the side for a long time. And it wasn't until... I was living in Australia and I had had this beautiful experience to create, for Australia at least, the first mindfulness-based learning environment for children there. It's called Smiling Mind, which is absolutely in line with what I was doing at the time, bringing meditation and neuroscience and academia and technology together. And I had to leave the country a little bit suddenly in the sense that my visa didn't come through. So I, you know, I had to leave... And then I just had this whole series of events unfold where the airplane that I was going to get on had a bird fly into the front window and there was a crack in the window and so we couldn't fly and they had to have a new window shipped in anyway. So this flight was eventually cancelled, but it actually catapulted me into this. I stayed for another month and traveled through Australia, which was my original plan anyway. And in that month, I think my intuition was what was guiding me. And I mean, this is going to sound maybe a little bit far out for the podcast, but I felt like I was very strongly connected to a very close friend of mine who had passed away. And I felt like he was really present with me for that month. And so I think at that time, that felt like a little bit of a homecoming for me, that experience of, oh, wow, there's something here about this that I really like. But I'm also quite secretive about it because I think it's going to sound very strange for people and a bit woo-woo. So I'll just keep it to myself. And so... I started to rely a little bit more on my own intuition, but saying that it was just that my way of doing things. That's just my way of knowing, right? And I don't think it was until three years ago where I was really reintroduced to the field of intuition through Ava, who's a dear friend and a colleague of mine. And she was working with an intuitive coach and she suggested, we were working on the new website for our business, Inward Creations. And she suggested, why don't we do an intuitive development method. We're both people that have senses about things and that's what guides us and we want to do this in a creative way. And in order to go into that process with that coach, she wanted to teach me the foundational background to this intuitive work that she coaches through. And I remember when she was teaching me that, she had me do certain exercises and I was just blown away by them. And she said, wow, this is easy for you to access. And I thought, no, this is the language that I've been searching for that I didn't know I was missing. So it's very recent that I'm really that intentionally aware around this is intuition and researching more and more for myself. What is intuition? How do other people work with it? 
I think before then, it was more of a secret thing that I used for me personally without understanding, yeah, or without having the same sort of openness and exploration around what it might be for others. Well, you reminded me of a quote, I think, that Rick Rubin made in his book, The Creative Act, because he said, look for what you notice, but no one else sees. Ooh, I like that. So coming to the pragmatic side of things then, how have you taken this capability that you have and bring it into the world of business? I think it's really interesting. What I notice more and more is that I don't think that there is a real distinction necessarily between creativity and intuition. So I think sometimes intuition is seen as more like the paranormal sense. I actually think that intuition is a way, an embodied way that we can access the field of possibility that is there. And I think creativity is the action that we take when we access the infinite field of possibility, right? It's something that we do with that. So realizing that these two elements actually belong together in some sort of way intrigues me. And I think also has me ask or beg the question, okay, I think probably this is a big statement, but maybe it's not now more than ever before. But I do think that in today's world of increasing artificial intelligence and technology and the landscape of what human skills and capabilities will add to life is shifting and is shifting quite rapidly. And I also think that most of us will acknowledge that a lot of the models that we've built, the social models, environmental models, business models, are not sustainable and they're not necessarily helping us maintain ourselves on this planet in a very healthy way. For me, the missing piece is really this tuning into creativity and the intuitive space. I think when we integrate that in our way of doing business, in our way of creating social policy, in our way of creating environmental policy or environmental projects, then we will generate more sustainable models. And I think also that creative intuitive space is the sort of unique human space as well. It's the space that's not inhabited by machines and AI. And I've heard people speak about how do you access your intuition? through the world of feeling more so than through the world of thinking. That's the way that we enter a space of creativity, of intuition. So given that, that's what I'm intrigued to bring to business is this understanding that it's not something that's really separate. It's not something that's just for the philosophers or for the religious practitioners or for the mediums or psychics out there. No, it's actually something all of us have and carry. And I was listening to this beautiful TEDx talk the other day by a man named Francis Chole, and he talks about intuitive intelligence and the importance of it in business. And I think in that, he iterates this exact point. He says, a lot of businesses are already making use of this. It's just to what degree do we value it? If you're enjoying this episode, I recommend you also listen to episode 53, where Ronald Paredes talked about rediscovering creativity. We now have more than 130 episodes, ranging from business and sport to the arts and social change. Just hop on over to access to inspiration.org to discover them all. Now back to our guest. What I'm hearing you say is it's integral to the way we work. And the more the AI and machines take over some of perhaps the more menial or simplistic activities that humans currently do, more and more humans are going to have to redefine what they bring to the business world. And this is one of the skills that is innately human. Yeah. And I think it's because we have the ability from that space to create associations that weren't there before. So it's like to notice the things that nobody else noticed. That's the unique, the creation of a song or a poem or a painting. It's just like an obvious representation of that. But that's true in business. That's true anywhere. I'm wondering if you've got any examples of how you've helped others to access their intuition or how your intuition has helped others. I do have examples. And they're all quite recent because I think it's only recently, like I said, that I've been more daring to sort of bring this sense out in the world, so out to others. 
but I have some beautiful examples. I've started to use it in my coaching. I work with groups and I work with individuals as a facilitator, as a coach. And I've been starting to introduce just bringing this intuitive work to others. So I use my intuition in the coaching as well as actually teaching others how to access their own intuition. And the feedback that I've been getting is really amazing, really amazing. So I had the pleasure of working with someone who said throughout all of his adult career where he's had executive coaches or people support him, he never before experienced coaching that was so aligned to his individual journey, more so than it was about a model of coaching or a model of development that then you try to like bring someone along with. He said, this is so attuned to me and you're so willing to follow my course, which helped him to understand himself more clearly. But I think also has this element of somebody feeling truly seen for who they are and what they bring. So that's been an incredible gift, I think, to share. So aside from doing this as an offering, as a business offering, I also leave people little intuitive readings and messages when I feel like they have a challenge or when they've asked me, can you look on with me? And I had a, a friend actually say recently, she said, every time that I feel lost or really like I'm not quite sure what to do next, I just re-listen to the message that you left me a year ago. And then I remember, ah, oh, this is my anchor. Okay, I just follow this. And I think that's really amazing that somebody will take something that was like an intuitive reading that I did and use it as an anchor in their own lives to sort of guide them in the right directions or remember. I think it's just this reminder. So I'll say a little bit of what these intuitive readings are designed around. So what I often do is what we call genius readings, but it's really about tuning into what's your specific gift or thing that you bring to the world that you're really passionate about and your unique life experiences accumulated over time have also generated. It's like you have your own little creative tool set. Like this is me, my experiences, my personality, my passion. And then together that brings something unique to the world. So how do you capture that for somebody in a reading in a few minutes? And I think when people have that, a little like a a blurb of that sitting in their in their voice message, for example, then it's just this reminder of, oh yeah, okay, there's something that I'm really good at and there's something that I'm here to bring. And so in that way, it's supporting people in a really beautiful way. Now, I know if like me, I'm sure there may be another listener out there thinking, oh, this is sounding really intriguing. So how can I access my intuition more? How can I use this that I'm hearing from Evelyn myself? Can people get a taste of it or be reminded themselves how they can tap into their own intuition? I think everybody has the ability to tune into intuition. I think it's a language that's accessible to all of us. And I know more and more, and I'm also reading more on this recently, is we tune into intuitive information from a place of rest, digest, and openness, right? So it takes a little bit of nervous system regulation to start us off with. I think we live, at least in modern society, we live in an environment generally that values to-dos and busyness and fullness and effectivity. And so I think in some ways, the first and probably hardest and most courageous move is to say, what would it be like to get off the treadmill for a moment and do some sort of thing that helps me regulate my nervous system, whether that's taking a slow walk out in nature, whether it's doing a breathing exercise or a meditation or whatever works for you. I mean, there are so many ways of regulating the nervous system so that you can help yourself shift from what we say, the fight, flight or freeze system to the rest and digest system. And in that rest and digest, then there is this openness to access the things that go otherwise unnoticed. And that's true for the things that you might notice in your environment, but it's also true for the information that you will receive around yourself, somebody else. And then I like to work with a little method that was developed by William Whitecloud, where you use a circle, like a defined space. So you might put a question that you have that you don't have an answer to yet, so you're thinking about it or unsure about it, and you write it down and you put a circle around it. And from that place of openness, in that parasympathetic nervous system state, you ask your intuition that question. And the idea is to let go of the need to know. So you don't think your way 
towards the answer, you might get an impulse, you might get an image, you might get a sound or a sense. You can also just leave it for a moment and find out what happens later. You know what I mean? And just go with whatever comes up later. The element that's really important is to let go of the question, how? When we ask the question, how? How will I get a new job? How will I find the perfect relationship? How will I? Then we're cognitively thinking about an answer. But intuition comes from a different space or place, as it were, just like creativity does. You don't think, how am I going to write a number one bestseller song? I, the answer to that question doesn't usually get the bestseller. It's usually an impulse, an emotive place that something emerges from. And it's the same with intuition. That's what I would leave the listeners with is if you want to play around with this, literally play with it. Because play, we started with this thing around play. Play is actually the way to enter the creative space and the intuitive space. I know that there are Nobel Prize winners who have come up with solutions to whatever challenge that they're exploring while playing. And that's when it appears. So it's like this phenomenon of why does my genius thing appear when I'm in the shower or doing the dishes? It's because we let go of the cognitive challenge or contraction around it and something else appears. So write it in a little circle, find a way to regulate your nervous system, write it in a circle and go with whatever comes up and allow yourself to play and to use your imagination. What does this mean? If I get a funny image, what does that image mean to me? And go with that. You so eloquently described a very practical way of accessing our intuition. You said, let go of the need to know. So that takes us into the realm of uncertainty. In my experience, when people face uncertainty, then the fight, flight or freeze it response can come out. So how do we feel comfortable enough from your experience? How do you and help other people to feel comfortable enough to stay with the uncertainty and the not needing to know whilst probably their brain is trying to keep them safe and give them a degree of certainty? I think that's probably why the small group setting of doing this together really works well. So I have a few examples of where that has worked really well. Because you're absolutely right, that's exactly what happens. And people often go with like, well, I have nothing, I have nothing. Or they don't trust what comes up because they think, I can't possibly know this, this can't possibly be right. This feels really unknown and, and strange and uncomfortable and what are we doing? And I find that when we do it in a group, there's always one person that's willing to share like, well, okay, I might be completely crazy, but this is what came up for me. And so I usually have people in a group circle around somebody that they don't know, that none of them know in the room. So I give them a name and I say, circle this person's genius. And I think most of them are terrified. They think, what is this? And this is such a strange exercise. But there's always some one person that feels a little bit more comfortable in that uncertainty or in that unknown is just willing to launch themselves and say, OK, this is what I got. And it's really amazing to see what happens in the room, the energy shift of people saying, oh, wow, that's quite similar to some things I got okay, well, maybe I'll share a little bit of what I got. And so I think then it becomes incremental, but I enjoy using the power of the group for that. When I do it one-on-one, -on -one, I often start with, this is what I got. And I think when people feel the confirmation, because it, it's incredible how similar it can be to what somebody comes up with for themselves. And then when there's a resonance there, then the uncertainty starts to ebb away a bit. Like, okay, maybe there's something here. And maybe if she's willing to go into this unknown space. Maybe I'll just go there a little bit with her. So as you're in this conversation with me right now, Evelyn, what does your intuition tell you about where we need to go next with the conversation? Mm. Well, I did a little intuitive circle before we started. And the thing that came through very clearly, because I love that you started with the word play because that's what came through, but also this idea of allow yourself to learn something about yourself that you didn't already know. So my sense was, ah, oh, well, Sue <laughs> has this incredible capacity of knowing how to ask really curious questions that lead in directions that I wouldn't expect. So in preparation for the podcast, you sent through some questions. And one of them, and I found it almost impossible to answer, was, what is your mantra or philosophy for life? And I thought, oh, that's such a great one. It would be so helpful if I had a mantra or philosophy for life. But I don't know if I do. And then... I did the intuitive circle and the thing that came through was, well, be open to learning something new that you didn't already know. And I thought, well, that's it. It's the mantra. That is the philosophy for life right there. So if we were to fast forward three years from now, what is it that you 
imagine that you might know then, but you don't know now? Oh, I know the answer to this is going to sound so way out of a ballpark, but here goes. So I have this funny sense and it comes up sometimes in my intuitive readings around my own future and trajectory. And it has to do with my ability to communicate with trees. So I imagine that three years from now, I may have a much stronger understanding around what that is, because at the moment, I don't feel a lot around that. I mean, sometimes I will spontaneously. You know, I've had it happen to me that I was in an orchard and I went up to this tree and I felt like that tree was much colder than the other trees. And I thought this tree isn't doing well. It's sick. It actually needs some attention, but it will just unintentionally appear all of a sudden. But I have this sense of, oh, there's something here about communicating with the earth that maybe as a child, I intuitively knew how to do with animals and trees. So that's what I imagine might be starting to blossom a bit more in three years from now. How funny that just this week, I've downloaded a book called The Hidden Life of Trees. Oh, wow. I'm a firm believer that there are so many forms. And we know this. This isn't pseudoscience. We know that other species are constantly in communication with one another. And I'm a firm believer that as humans, we can learn to tap into that in a way that would be really helpful for creating more generative ways of living with the world, in the world, on the world. So as we close our conversation today, Evelyn, which has been fascinating, if there was one piece of practical advice that you could offer to our listener to help them to start down this journey or to continue down this journey of accessing their inner knowing, their inner sense of intuition to bring to the world, what would your piece of advice be? I would first go with some of the academic facts that they've done tons of research This is research from the 80s. It's a little bit outdated in some ways, but I wonder if it's any different today, where they interviewed 1,500 CEOs all across America, all across different professional domains, and they found that 81% of the CEOs actually used their intuition to make certain decisions. And I know from that TEDx video that I shared that I watched, which I will recommend maybe also for the show notes, is that I think it's the head of L'Oreal has said that she makes a lot of her decisions based on intuition. So I think it is there. I think probably a lot of us unknowingly or maybe secretively, like I've been doing for so many years, are using our intuition in practical, pragmatic, day-to-day life. So my suggestion and encouragement to the listeners would be listen for that. What is the gut feel that you have around something? How does it speak to you? And what is it like when you follow it just playfully? Or notice what happens when you don't follow it. Because very often I'll hear people say like, I had a sense of that and then I didn't do it. It's like, okay, there's something there. The beautiful thing about our intuition and our creativity, I think, is that it's a feedback mechanism that is helping us steer our way through life. And a lot of what we are doing in life is based on very limited information. So why not explore what intuition has to offer to that and just see what happens? What a lovely way to end our conversation, Evelyn. And if our listener wants to find out more about you and the work you do, how might they do that? The easiest place is probably LinkedIn. Fantastic. Well, we'll put the link to that on the show notes. And I wish you well as you head into the future and remind more people about how they can tap into their intuition to benefit us all. Thank you again for your time. Thank you so much for having me, Sue. It's been such a delight. I hope you enjoyed what Evelyn had to say and that you're reflecting on how you can become more intuitive. I invite you to share this episode with just one other person that you think would appreciate listening to it. That way, your support helps us to reach new people and continue changing the world one inspirational story at a time. Next time, I speak to Mark Fletcher, who founded an esports team as a way of honouring his mum. I hope you can join us then.